The modern perception of Gameloft as a company is, well, bad. Money-grabbing, uninspired, and generic all come to mind when we hear Gameloft. But it wasn't always like this. Our story begins in 1999, the year Gameloft was founded by one Michael Guillemot, who was also the, one of the five founders of Ubisoft. And Gameloft's ambitions back then could not be further from what they are today. Yes, making money was in mind, but back then the company wanted to be ahead of its time in the mobile space, and they succeeded. They were responsible for some of the first ever mobile shooters, and by 2014 they had reached their peak. Some of the best ever mobile games were released by Gameloft during this time, and that's by no means an exaggeration. Modern Combat, Asphalt 8, Nova 3, <laughs> Minion Rush. Let's look at one game in particular though, Nova 3. Vanguard Alliance. Released in 2012, Nova was one of the best ever mobile first-person shooters to be publicly available for more than a month, and would still be an incredible game to this day. It offered smooth and fun multiplayer combat, an engaging campaign, and the graphics? <laughs> the graphics were absolutely stunning. Even in 2020, they would still look pretty good, and the game's eight years old. Each Gameloft game had its own unique signature. Nova had this Halo-esque combat. Each engagement was like a combat puzzle, conserving ammo, strategically rotating enemies, learning what equipment to use and when. And this is only complemented by the incredible graphics. Nova wasn't the only game like this, though. And Gameloft was kind of considered the cool game publisher of its time. It would listen to fans, would have minimal microtransactions, and the overall quality had just never been before seen. It would tragically never be seen again. By 2015, the mobile market was changing. Being a cool company was not as profitable anymore as the mobile game industry went mainstream. Guillemot held his ground though. As profits declined, his spirits did not. While Gameloft was in the red, Vivendi came out of the blue. Okay, well not actually. Uh, in, in fact, its original name was Compagnie Générale des Eux and was founded in 1853 by Napoleon III and was only later then renamed to Vivendi after it modernized in 1998. But I like that line, so I'm keeping it. Vivendi would grow to become a super conglomerate by 2015 and owned equity in hundreds of companies, small to big, like Ubisoft, UMG, Dailymotion, Activision, Comcast, Blizzard. You get the point. They're big. But they were looking to get bigger. Like any digital media conglomerate in the 2010s, mobile gaming was a huge point of interest. And Vivendi wanted nothing more than to get their greasy corporate hands on the mobile gaming industry. It didn't take long for them to get their chance. By late 2015, Gameloft was on the verge of collapse. With bankruptcy on the horizon, Guillermo and his studio were out of options. To make matters worse, Vivendi was now fixated on the acquisition of Gameloft. With every passing day, the pressure for Guillermo to sell his company grew stronger. He wasn't losing this battle just yet though. He knew the company's fate if he were to give in. Over the next few months, Vivendi's share in Gameloft slowly climbed, 6%, then 11%, then 17%. But Guillemot wouldn't give in. Until he did. He had no choice. It was either lose the company, or have it bought by Vivendi. And as the employees of Gameloft received their letters welcoming them to the Vivendi family, I can't help but imagine it was a sad time for everyone involved. Except Vivendi. Guillemot left Gameloft soon after, and by early 2016, Vivendi owned 95% of Gameloft's equity. But you, the gamer, doesn't give a damn about equity and conglomerates. You just want to play good games. So the real question is, did the games Gameloft published change? Well, let's look at the highly anticipated sequel, Nova Legacy. Legacy was released in 2017, uh, just a year after Gameloft's acquisition. I still remember my first time playing this game. I was sitting on the couch, and after a long day of school, I saw Legacy on the Play Store. I was filled with joy. You see, Nova 3 was no longer supported on the App Store, so this game would finally reimmerse me back into the Nova universe. That day, 13-year-old me learned what true disappointment feels like. This game sucked. It looked bad. It was full of microtransactions. The missions were bland. The gunplay was watered down. The narrative was non-existent. The game had completely lost its character. And this was not an isolated trend. Every single game published by Gameloft suffered from this, even ones released prior to the acquisition. The unique charm and quality of each game melted away and were absorbed into the corporate white noise that was the mobile gaming market. There's a concept in Japanese culture called Mano no Oware. 
It is a philosophy that the most beautiful things in life are the things that are temporary. Maybe the very impermanence we despise about Nova 3 and its era of games is what gives these games beauty. Maybe that's why we're so obsessed with Area F2, as it's one of the few games that was only temporary. This video wasn't to get you to hate large corporations, as I'm sure you already do, nor was it even about the true nature of game loft and its origins. We think of many things in life as permanent, that they will be there when and where we want, but at the end of the day, you have no idea when the next Vivendi will come, so don't take a single thing for granted. You don't know what you have until it's gone. Mono. No. Awarded.